<laughs> but yeah, I hope you guys had fun. Uh, so now it's time to get onto the main bit of our session. This is like a nice, juicy, juicy bit, which we all love. So today we are so lucky and so blessed to have the association of Ian Nene from the Bhakti Vedanta Manor. And I'm pretty sure most of you know him from, uh, from SNL, from Project X, from the PG Challenge. But we're so lucky to have you today. And before I start, I have like a short little thing that kind of like sums him up, a short little poem. It's not like a sentence. It's like a short thing, but it's not that great, but it's great. I don't know. But <laughs> go like this. Ian is the humble servant of Radha Gopalananda's lotus feet. When he shares humble. their glories, it is the most sweet. With this association, you'll gain a love for the scriptures, which is so deep. His enthusiasm and smile is so infectious, more than corona. With all the spiritual joy, you will fight, you will feel higher than a stoner. So without further ado, I wanna I wanna hand over to Ian then. <laughs> First of all, round of applause to you, Neam, because that was lit. <laughs> that was a good poem. Although I don't know if most of the stuff you said there was true, but um I'll take it, I'll allow it. Hi Krishna, everyone. I was just looking and I was seeing 64 participants. Oh my God, you guys have set yourself for failure, bro. You're gonna be disappointed by this talk. <laughs> but anyway, the 64 people here, and I'm sure I can see in some, some, some pages or some of you guys, you're more than three in your rooms. So I guess you're more than 60. That's a bare load of people. But it's okay, we'll try to share something. Thank you so much for the service. It's always nice to kind of get an interesting topic from Niam and the team and then having to think about it and see how we can present it, how we can turn, how we can understand, go deeper and believe people in spiritual life. Main issue is people don't think being spiritual is a cool thing. But then we come into contact with such kind of knowledge, information, practices, like we do in Krishna Consciousness. And then we actually live a pretty late life, you know what I mean? And we have such a good time, even in a spiritual circle. So I think today it's a collaboration. We've got um, the Center Knights group, I believe, with the Project X group. So I think I'm getting a wide array from year 10 to 13. Um, thank you guys for, you know, I don't want to say wasting your time because you didn't waste your time. You're coming together. But hopefully anything I share will be sensible. So first off, we'll begin by reciting a short Mangala Charan, getting the positive vibes from those who actually have positive vibes, the people I get my juice from. <laughs> who, the, the glory about our practice is we actually get spiritual energy that's been passed down from generation to generation. I'll always emphasize this, that what we're studying, what we are diving into is not just something, you know, that some dude just cooked up from behind his crib. Like this has actually been there for centuries as a means for spiritual emancipation. So that's it. We're gonna recite these mantras. If you know the mantras, join me. If you don't know the mantras, close your eyes and vibe with the vibes. <laughs> and then we'll get started with a very interesting topic. Om Ajnana Timirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Shakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Svapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Padakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunatan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvetam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Shri Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakan Vitamscha Hey Krishna, Karuna Sindhu, Dina Bandu, Jagatpate, Gopisha, Gopika Kanta, Radha Kanta, Namostute, Tapta Kanchana Gorangi, Radhe Vrindavaneshwari, Vishabhanu Sute Devi, Panamami Hari Priye. 
ಪ್ರಚಾರಿಣೆ ನಿರ್ವಿಶೇಷ ಶೂನ್ಯವಾದಿ ಪಾಶ್ಚತ್ಯಾಶತಾರಿಣೆ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭು ನಿತ್ಯನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಗದಾಧಾರ ಶ್ರೀವಾಸ್ ಅಧಿ ಗೌರ ಭಕ್ತ ವೃಂದ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೇ ಹರೇ ಹರೆ ರಾಮ ಹರೆ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೆ 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 ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಸೊ ಲೇಡೀಸ್ ಇನ್ ಜೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಟುಡೇ ವಿ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಡಿಸ್ಕಸಿಂಗ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಟ್ರೆಸ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಟಾಪಿಕ್ ಆಕ್ಚುಲಿ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಕ್ವೈಟ್ ನೈಸ್ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ ಟು ಸಿ ದಟ್ ಯು ಗೈಸ್ ಐ ಬಿಟ್ವೀನ್ ಇಸ್ 10 ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ 13 ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಯು ಆಕ್ಚುಲಿ ಡಿಸ್ಕಸಿಂಗ್ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುಯಾಲಿಟಿ ಐ ವಾಸ್ ಆನ್ ಅ chat i don't know if you guys were part of the of of some of you guys were there when we had the talk um at the avanti school and it's like man when i was you know in year between year 10 and 13 i had no understanding about spirituality apart from potted philosophy which niam was slightly mentioning <laughs> in his poem that's the only thing i knew and it was still utter rubbish you know didn't give me any clarity then give me any openness and understanding of this world that we live in but then you guys man are just chilling here casually discussing spiritual life as part of his spare time how jealous am i of you like you guys are very fortunate really really fortunate i always mention this 8 billion people in this planet probably 9 we just don't know if they're counting it right and we've got 0.01% of people like yourselves who will actually want to dive deep spiritually or at least hang around with people trying to understand spirituality or be also trying to propagate it for yourself that is lit <laughs> that is that is where the source is at you guys have a wonderful opportunity and you're taking advantage of it and i'm actually quite jealous of that but you know i got jealousy is not a good trait um but i need to learn and be inspired by all of you so thank you for giving me this service the topic today we're discussing gender equality a very very interesting topic this topic is approached in very very different angles at times it leaves people enthusiastic about spiritual life at times it leaves people quite upset about spiritual life it opens so many different things but i know i'm with mature people here today so we'll kind of get to discuss things in a nice clear way get your perspective also and draw the proper conclusions that books like the gita are asking us to have i don't know if this is the best avenue for me to share this but um we one of the groups we had a challenge a gita challenge where i got everyone um who was in the group to share reflection open the bhagavad gita at least chant one round of the maha mantra every day but open on at least on one day the bhagavad gita read a verse and then share it to the group of friends or with the group the guys in the group about what that verse means to them and how they can apply it in their life and kind of give us a general gist or a lesson that we can get from the Bhagavad Gita. And so the SNL crew actually did an amazing job and I was quite dumbfounded <laughs> by the amount of philosophical prowess that you guys carry and it's also pretty much jealous because when I was your age I didn't have any knowledge like this so I'm quite inspired. And so I know we have the Project X group here. So I don't know if the Project X group gang would be down to do the same thing. It would be quite nice just to also see if you guys also have, you know, a similar level of prowess, philosophical depth, understanding of spirituality as the SNL gang. So I'll leave that up to Niam. If Niam thinks it's a good idea, he's my boss. I just follow my boss on his servant. Then you guys could also do something. we are progressing and trying to add more things but at the moment we're waiting for this whole covid situation to kind of be clarified if things are going to open up then we can get to link up and do stuff on a practical basis get some monks around people like sita pupu who are quite excited to associate with you guys and kind of you know share more spiritual insight and stuff like that 
Um, so we'll be pausing on that until we have some clarification, but otherwise we do have some stuff planned. So I'm not sleeping on you guys. I'm actually, um, I'm on it, I'm on it. Now we'll dive into the topic for today. So gender equality, it's a very, very interesting one. I wanna make it open door policy as always. My chat's open. You can send any questions regarding this topic that you might have, any concerns, anything. And I'll present some, something very basic and very simple. I'm not the most smart guy. I don't know why Niam calls me for these talks because I'm not the smartest guy to like explain these kind of topics, but somehow or other, I got the service. But if you have any questions about this topic, about gender equality, how you understand it from a spiritual angle, whether you have any doubts, anything you find interesting that you'd want us to discuss, pop it on the chat. If you're not comfortable popping it on the chat in front of everyone, you can send it to me privately and then I'll read it out at the end and we can have a small discussion. Hopefully I won't spend too much time on this, but I'll try to explain everything as nicely as I can. So, I went online to kind of do like research on what gender equality actually means. Probably I can get one person actually to probably share with me. Who's confident enough? Who's Mr. Bold or Mrs. Bold to just unmute their mic and let me know what they understand gender equality to mean? It would be nice to hear from someone. Any bold person. Arian, you look quite bold. I feel like you can give me some keys over there with your gold chain. <laughs> I don't know if it's a gold chain, but yeah, I feel like you can give me some proper keys. Anything you understand about spirituality uh, and gender equality in regards to spirituality? Anything you understand? Or what gender equality? Let's start from there. What gender equality actually means? Um, so the gender equality is basically the equality of uh, sexes. Um, so... Um, everyone should be valued equally um, as the same and no one should be treated uh, more than the other. Um, yeah. That's it. That's it. Thank you for sharing, my guy. That's it. So when I went to look for a much more scientific thing, because I knew I'm talking to intelligent people, so I knew you guys would also do a referencing, I got this wonderful um, definition of gender equality. Gender equality between man and woman is a state of equal case of access to resources and opportunities, regardless of gender, including economic participation and decision-making. It entails the concept that all human beings, both men and women, are free to develop their personal abilities and make choices without limitations. Quite a good definition, very, very intelligent. When I read this definition, it tells me access to resources, and opportunities entails the concept that human beings are free to develop their personal abilities and make choices without limitations. Now, when I look at this definition from a spiritual angle, I understand that based on this definition, spirituality is encompassing this fully. One thing we need to note is the equality being driven by the term gender equality is on a material level. As transcendentalists, we're being told basically by Krishna <laughs> that you're all <laughs> of a similar what quality. I hear some sounds. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Anyway, that's fine. We understand that we're actually all equal because our quality as an individual spark is the same. Spirituality doesn't start from the process of the body. It transcends this body. So when I look at everyone on my screen, I'm seeing different genders, different looks, different hairstyles, different preferences of how externally we might look. But the common factor amongst all the people on this screen is that you're all spiritual souls and caged in the particular body that you're in at present. So that's the first thing that spiritual life is actually based on, that you're not this body. You ain't this body, my G. You ain't this body, sis. None of y'all are this body that you're in. Somehow or other, you've taken a body. One's a lady's body, this other one is some buff thing. Okay, fine, you've gotten a body. But that body is not you you're almost guaranteed that this body at the end of your cycle of life will either turn to 
three things. Your body could either turn to ashes. Your body could either merge in the dirt. Or your body could actually turn to stool if it's eaten by another animal. So you're guaranteed, all of us are guaranteed that our body will turn to one of these three things, isn't it? So we're being, it's being made clear to us that the philosophy we're practicing is transcending this bodily conception. That you're actually not this body, you're the spirit soul. And so the spiritualists would never think about equality like that. It's like me saying, okay, guys, guys who wear an orange jacket are equal to those who wear a green jacket. You probably look at me and be like, what the hell is this guy saying? It's obvious that they're both equal, right? It doesn't matter whether it's a green jacket or whether it's a yellow jacket or a black jacket, whatever. You're all equal regardless. So it's like rocket, it's, it's, it's not rocket science for a transcendentalist. And that's why spiritual scripts already begin having transcend this understanding because boom, we're spiritual beings. If we look at, if we try to understand where this conception of I and my comes, it comes from the contact with the body and identifying with the body. Hey, my name is Bhavini. What are you going to tell me? I'm in this body as Bhavini. Nah, my name is Diana. What are you going to tell me? I'm in this body as, as Diana. No, my name is Lola. Wagwan. No. The scriptures begin having transcended this conception. Christian, according to the scriptures, is not Christian. Christian is a spirit soul covered in the body that's been labeled Christian. Right? I hope that's clear. If anyone has any questions, boom, pop it on the chat. Now we'll move on to something else that I found interesting based on this. So we understand that there's two things being compared, male psychology and female psychology. Is that right? That's what's being compared. And so from a materialist, they're saying, oh, no, the male psychology and the female psychology should be almost non-different. But I want to pose to you guys some questions and let me hear from you guys. I want to understand, what do you understand about the male psychology? Give me characteristics of the male psychology. Pop it for me in the chat right now. I want to see. What do we understand male psychology to be? Or any, okay, I can make it quite easier. Understanding the characteristics of men. <laughs> Throw it in there. What characteristics do we generally get about men? A construction of societies, expectations, and stereotypes. Oh, okay. Patriarchy, more dominant, bold. Anuja, that's a good one. <laughs> Hench, like Liam. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> you guys are funny. Anyone else? Leaders. Okay, that's interesting. Bhavani says leaders. Anything else? make decisions, egotistical. All right, all right. So that's what we get about men. Let's see, is there any more coming through before I kind of jump onto the other side of things? Objective, less emotional, rigid mind and less emotions, emotionally distant, macho, narcissist. <laughs> all right, all right. Okay, fine. I think that's enough. Now I want us to do Okay, so we've kind of just mentioned in general. From these, we can see there's some strengths and some weaknesses. So we can say leadership is a strength. Making decisions and being concise is a strength. Egotistical, probably not the best of strengths, but ego can be used in a positive way, I guess. Emotionally distant is a weakness, right? Narcissistic can be a weakness and can be a strength if it's argued both ways. But let's, we look at it from this angle as a, as a weakness. Now let's jump onto the other side. Let's look at female psychology. How do we understand and define female psychology? What's your understanding of female psychology? Emotional, uh -huh. vulnerable, okay. Jaimika, I hope you're not, you guys are not exposing yourselves. <laughs> Selfless, okay, always right. Ah, gentle and subservient. Okay, I like that. Patient, soft-hearted, empathetic, motherly, and competent. Think wisely. Wow, wow. Good definitions here. Anyone else? Unstable, strong, more understanding, accepting, understandable. Okay, I like these. 
long hair. <laughs> That's a bodily, look at this guy. <laughs> That's a bodily definition. We're looking at just a general psychology, right? Powerful, illogical. Okay, fine. So we've got in some interesting things here, reactive. What can we understand from these things that you guys have mentioned? There's one interesting thing we can draw a conclusion of. If we're to introspect and look at these qualities, we see that the weaknesses of, feminine, of, of male energy is actually a strength of female energy. Right? So someone writes, for example, illogical on the feminine sides in how they're trying to probably make decisions. You can say at times anxiety can build. But then on the other side, we say that the person is stern. The, the, the uh, male energy is quite stern in its decision making. So what can seem to be a weakness for the, for the feminine energy is actually a strength for the masculine energy. Another one we see is that um, the men are said to be emotionally distant, right? But what's emotionally distant for the male energy Female energy is actually seen to be emotionally available, very, very understanding, very, very caring. That's why if you like hurt your leg, you won't go to your boys and be like, yo, I hurt my leg. You know, you, you, can, go to, you can go to the lady and then she'll be like, oh, oh, look at you. Or she's like, should I get you a patch or something? Should I call for you the doctor? You know, because they'll be more receptive to reciprocate to their emotions. But if you did that on the other side, they'd be like, yo, man, man up, man, you're not the body. <laughs> So we can see what's a strength for the feminine energy is a weakness simultaneously to some extent for the male energy. And so what can we understand? That equality is actually based on the spirit soul and masculine and feminine energy work as a team. They work as a team to make any society prosperous. In your home, I, I don't know if you guys had this, so I lived with my stepfather for a while. My stepfather wasn't the nicest of guys. So he was very much emotionally unavailable. And so if I needed money to go do some shopping or something just for my own sense gratification, he's the last person I'd go to. I'd first go to moms and be like, hey mom, so you know, I did well in school, kind of. I got, I got a B in my test because I was quite dumb. So a B for me was like a, a, an A star, you know what I mean? So I'd be like, yeah, I got a B in my test. And so, you know. I kind of sold these things that I wanted to buy from the store. And, you know, I think mom, you know, you can just sort me out. And then when my mom would tell me, you know, you go ask your dad, I'd be like, okay, <laughs> it's all right. Let's go rob a bank because we're not going to get anything. Then at times I'd try to go to my pops and be like, okay, pops, um, I want to get this and that. And then he'd be like, okay, what for? Can you do without it? If you don't have it, will you die? Okay, no. <laughs> very, very stern. So we would choose who to go to for what. If you're having an emotional issue, some people will be, I don't know, probably guys can give me in, in the chat. Who will you go to? Will you go to Momsy when you're having an emotional issue or will you go to Pops? Some people might have an ability to go to Pops. For the girls, they probably will go to their dad, daddy's little girl. And for the guys, most definitely they'll go to their Momsy. Okay, or even we have some girls who go to their Momsy. And we even have some guys who won't go to their Pops or their Momsy, they'll go to their friend. <laughs> I ain't gonna risk it with none of them. <laughs> Fair enough. But yeah, you'll see. So the feminine energy can be very, very reciprocated, very, very understanding and very, very caring. Simultaneously, the male energy can be very, very stern, very, very stoic, very, very somewhat rigid. But this balance is needed on both sides for someone to be in a safe circumstance. There needs to be this balance. That's why at times if, if a girl goes to cry out to their mom, the mom will tell her, you stop being a crybaby all the time because these are two emotional beings coming together and combining. But if the girl goes to the papa and is like, dad, I'm feeling like this, dad will be like, okay, what do you want? <laughs> How do I calm you down? I need to get this over and done with. What do you want? Tell me. All right, I'll send you. No problem. It creates a balance. So the scriptures and spirituality actually looks at it like this that we're all spiritual beings. We're all spirit souls. And so the basis of being uh, female or male actually works as a team for perfection in this world. You know? So it's not that one is better than the other. Remember this, the spiritual aspect of things never gives this kind of a comparison. 
Where does this comparison come from? From less spiritual people who do not understand the objective of spirituality. And so for them, enjoyment on the material platform is what's most significant. And so if I see, yo, Aryan is enjoying more than me, I'll be like, yo, what, what good things is Aryan having to get that I can't get, you know? Diana is enjoying more than me. Oh, because she's a girl now. So all these things are that they're happening. Why? Because people have left that spiritual understanding of things. But from a spiritual angle, we understand we're actually all spirit soul. And so these energies, the feminine and the masculine, they work together for wellness, for stability, for balance. They talk about yin and yang, right? That gives balance. At times when people are dating, they usually write a note to, you know, their girlfriend, you know, you're the yin to my yang. <laughs> and it's like, oh, you give me my balance, isn't it? I don't know if you guys do the same thing. Or if you guys even write poems anymore, it's probably TikTok videos. I don't know. I don't know how this world goes nowadays. I don't have these apps. But uh, yeah, a balance is needed. And a balance has been emphasized. We even see it in the scriptures. Where is Krishna without Radharani? Where is Sita without Ram? There's always that balance. And Krishna consciousness works from this basis as well. Never sectarian. Always understanding. Never judging based on externals. Always understanding that that's our identity. And that the activities that we're doing are actually based on this fundamental point. That we're not this body. That sooner or later, we're going to go back to our actual original forms and live our life like this. But then I'll pose an interesting question. Is that, okay, wait, why are there uh, psychological differences between the two genders if we're all souls? Interest, actually, I was about to come to this. I don't really think they're quite different because I was going to ask you this question. So we said, you know, that, you know, some male energy can be, you know, stern and stoic. And then the female energy can be more understanding and receptive and emotional. And then the other side is less emotional. Do we have circumstances where we have male, people in male bodies having more feminine attributes? Yes or no? Pop it on the chat. Do we have circumstances where females have the ability to make stern, firm decisions? Yes or no? Do we have circumstances where actually the guy that you go have a chat to is more understanding than all the girls. Not because he wants to get your number though, but just because he actually understands from an emotional perspective, your situation, right? I'm seeing yeses, 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 and yeses. So what can we understand about this? It's not a you versus me kind of an, a, a mentality. It's not that simplistic. These bodies that we have, as we've ever explained in scriptures, is based on different things. Guna and karma. Guna, vi karma. guna karma, vibhagasha. Based on guna and karma, the body you have has certain attributes. Some that are more masculine. Some that are more feminine. To even give you that balance within yourself. Who says men don't cry? Men are the biggest crybabies. They just won't show you. You know? <laughs> it's, it, it exists. I remember we used to have one bull in our school, yeah. It was like some big macho guy. And um, actually, this was probably not the nicest thing to say. And I was quite skinny. Well, I'm still quite skinny. And, uh, you know, I used to do the treadmill. So these guys used to go and do rugby and stuff. And I'd only play rugby when we had to do it, you know. And all I'd do is just, I'd be, I don't know what you call them, runners. I don't know. You get the ball and you just run to the other side. Winger or something like that. I don't really remember. But then we had this guy like big guy you know and he was like so staunch and very hardcore and he used to tell me yo Ian you just go run on the treadmill because there's nothing else you're gonna do over here you ain't got no muscle get out of here you know and he would belittle me because I was quite feeble and you know tiny you know but I had a mouth that was my problem so he acted all macho and then one time we were in the gym and I was actually quite, okay, so he was rude to me first. Like, uh, this is like my childhood coming out. This, I think, happened in year 12. <laughs> so he came to me and, you know, he was, I, I ended up doing some of the activities. Like, you're like on a pram and then you're pulling it. And you're, and you're getting like points based on how much you pull. And obviously my hands, you can see it's like, you know, stick figures. I'm not like me, I'm buffing over here. So I'm like here trying to pull. 
And then he's just like laughing at me and, you know, saying all these like rude things <laughs> about me, you know, in front of everyone. And obviously, you know how it is in high school at times. Everyone will laugh at the, you know, the loudest and be like, yo, 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 Ian, I can't take that if I were you. Ian, I can't take that if I were you. And so they were doing that and hyping up the situation. Then I just, I got angry. And so I told him, bro, I won't mention his name because he might watch this in the future. So I told him, bro, you might think you have a bomb body, but there's no gene for your face. <laughs> and then everyone was just like, oh. And then I looked at his face and I just saw tears. <laughs> tears just filling his eyes, you know? And I remember it was actually quite an emotional thing because I'd never seen him cry before, but it hit him on the spot, you know? And he was emotional. And he's like stormed out, went to the room, locked himself in the locker and then you say, and then everyone came to me like I'm a hero. It's like, I did that, but you know, I was just, I was just, you know, retaliating. I, I feel really bad that I made that comment. You shouldn't diss people like that. You know, we're not this bodies. So even though he can't find a gym for his face, he's a wonderful person. <laughs> and so I shouldn't have said that, but I was angry. So I said it. And then this emotion came out. So even though he masked externally that he's a macho person, he actually had some deep emotions, you know? It's like you see Drake from outside and then you hear his music and you're like, actually, he's quite emotional, bro, you know? Because it's there. The understanding of masculine and feminine is very, very complex. Also, what makes it even more complex is that we're ever transforming and changing. The world that we're living in right now is a very, very different world that was being lived in 100, 200, 300 years ago where my life path and your life path would be totally different based on the body that you're in. And so there will never even be any time for comparison. In Vedic times, guys and girls would only meet for marriage. <laughs> they would only meet when that's the deal, you know? I know like where I come from in Kenya, you know, my mom would tell us this, like, so the, the girls would come and, you know, they're, they're doing their washing and stuff like that. Then the guys have just come from hunting. So they're just checking out the other side. Hey, what's happening over there? <laughs> what's happening over there? Look at that one. You know? And then that's where interaction would happen. But we even see it in the Vedic scriptures. When the guy grows up, Varnashram Dharma, he moves into a, an ashram, like kind of like what I've done, you know, gets some training. And then from there, once he's strong spiritually, he graduates and move into a, moves into a different space. And then from there, gets a wife and starts to cultivate spiritual reality with a family. And then from there, progresses and then has to renounce everything and then move into the forests and dives deep into spiritual life and then leaves his body connected with Krishna. The ladies, it would be the same thing based on the guna and karma that the ladies have. They would be trained on certain skills that work to their propensities. And then from there, they'd be cultivated into being strong, independent women that can run a home and create foundation and stability in a home. And so based on the amount of work that the parents did, they would get a suitable man of high stature and caliber and then unite them together. And so when the guy goes to work or, or has to leave the space, she can command the space, you know? In Shatrik homes, the ladies were taught how to fight as well. And so they had martial arts skills because if someone came and was like, I'm looking for your husband, you'd be like, but well, you gotta go through me first. You gotta catch these hands. <laughs> That would be the plan. They were all trained in all these things. Her life path was also quite different. She was trained in different duties, understanding her nature from that perspective, understanding philosophy from that perspective. So there was no time for a guy to look at a girl and compare and a girl to look at a guy and compare. But as things have obviously changed and evolved till now, now obviously we're all in the same space and playing field, right? And so... It's, it could be quite easy to, to look and compare and try to, even in a house, you know, why does my sister get this and that every time she asks? And every time I ask, it's like, oh, you don't need it, you know? Why is Papa so nice to my sister? But every time I go talk to Pops, Pops is being so mean to me. And this comparison starts to breed. But in previous times, we understand that obviously the life path was different. And the fact is, it's quite different. I used to play PS and I had this game called Tekken. I don't know if you guys know Tekken. If anyone knows Tekken, it was like, like a fighting game. This is like quite good. Oh, Mortal Kombat. That's another easy one. I'm sure people know Mortal Kombat. So you could get one character in Mortal Kombat. I'm trying to remember. Do I remember their names? 
I don't even remember. Someone give me a male character from Mortal Kombat. Kang Lee or something. There was like Kang Lee or he would do like these weird kicks and everything. If you want to make this do- Okay, Scorpion. Someone put Scorpion. Dark Shadow. So if you get this character, you'd have to do a particular code to get this character to bust a move. Someone give me a female character that would be there. There used to be that one who used to have like two things on like her hands. I don't remember. And then she'd have her mouth covered and then she'd like open and it's like, ah, <laughs> for example. Okay, wait, there's something here. Katana, there we go. So, hey, someone knows this. The same person is giving all these names. Arian, where you at? <laughs> Katana. So if you have Katana as a character, she's a female. She's got different moves. If you press the moves that Katana has on Sub-Zero, you won't get the same result. And if you press the moves that Sub-Zero has on Katana, you won't get the same results. Does that make sense? So with each form, with each body, there's certain attributes and things that can be worked on to stimulate their spiritual progress. That's where the magic is. And so one of my mentors, Sutapa Bubuhiole says this, we have to find an intensity that suits our personality in order to blossom spiritually. And that's quite a boss ass statement. Find an intensity that suits you. Okay, Lola, if you have something that suits you, Lola, go for it. And if it works for you, even if it's on the masculine or feminine side of things, you work with it and connect that with Krishna and watch yourself receive spiritual benefit. So from a spiritual angle, we see that in the age that we're living in right now, we work based on what we've got. And then from there, see how we can progress and advance in our spiritual life. It's very, very much factored based on time, place, and circumstance. And we can also understand this from our founder, Srila Prabhupada. He was quite intelligent with how he did these things. He actually broke rules that the scriptures gave, you know. The scriptures said only Brahmins can actually chant such Vedic mantras. Actually, not the scriptures, Vedic times. Let's work with Vedic times. It was tradition that only Brahminical classes of men could be able to engage in spiritual philosophy. But now I'm on this chat and I'm 100% not Brahminical. I'm a rascal and a half. But somehow other thanks to Prabhupada's mercy, I can be sat here understanding spiritual life and learning from, you know, different people about spiritual knowledge. It was in Vedic times that only men were allowed on an altar. You know, only men had, were allowed on an altar. But then Prabhupada came and said, nah, some of these ladies can dress better than you all. Put them on the altar also. And so the ladies all got a chance to be on the altar. The ladies are offering puja, you know. And we see this trend also being not just then right now with Prabhupada, but also in the scriptures and in the Vedic times. In the scriptures, we see, for example, Queen Kunti. Queen Kunti is celebrated as one of the most topmost Vaishnavas. So Krishna says, oh, you think that only men can be spiritually transcendental? I'll give you Queen Kunti. You think it's only men who can become sur- or who, who can surrender to Krishna? I'll give you Draupadi. She put her hands up and said, hey, Govinda, hey, Gopal, and everything got sorted out. So actually we see that in the sphere of spirituality, we don't have any isms existing because all isms have been slashed by the full understanding that I'm a spirit soul and you're a spirit soul too. And so now we have to find, okay, now I'm here living as Krish, Mr. Limbachia. How do I live in my world now, practicing spirituality and rendering service that can be beneficial for everyone at large and that can be respectful to both my male counterparts and female counterparts? How can I live this kind of a life? And then Kelly will also be like, okay, hey, how can I live a spiritually transcendental life where I'm not making Aryan feel like, uh, uh, Aryan, I'm better than you. And just encourage Aryan, wherever he's at, to dive into his spirituality. Regardless of what body we're in, this is the magic of Krishna consciousness. 
that I can look at Neil and be like, bro, Neil, you're a sad you're trying to become more spiritual. All glories to you. I look at Sita and Vrinda and I'm like, both of y'all are amazing people trying to dive into your spirituality. And so we're all diving in regardless of the bodies that we have because these bodies ain't gonna last, you know? They'll come, they stay for a while, produce some effect, they wither, and then at some point, we have to bounce. And I'll be like, peace, see you in the next one. But hopefully, our goal is to not get to our next one and actually transcend back to the spiritual world. Back to where you're just fully the spirit. And so nothing like judgment can even exist. And this is it. Powerpad came to give us this. And so when I see all of you guys here, I'm quite, I get to understand actually Powerpad was effective in creating a space where different people can come together and connect on spirituality, connect in Krishna consciousness, feel the same responses while chanting the mantra, understanding the philosophy, peering to the depth of scripture and actually get the benefit. Some questions are popping in. Some of them are popping in privately. Some of them are popping in publicly. So I'll bounce through that. But I hope that kind of makes it somewhat clear from the angle of scriptures. So at times statements may have been made that made it look that actually no, women are less than, or in one aspect, men are, are, are much more advanced than. But when we understand these are not being made on the basis of comparison, they're being made just on the basis of psychophysical ability within a particular body. And so if let's say we're about to go into a battle and you know, Ram is chilling there and then Ari is chilling there as well. How am I going to go to Arya first and tell her you pick the gun? Nah, I'll go to Ram first. <laughs> and I'll be like, okay, Ram, this is a strategy. We go and we shoot and we make sure Ari is protected. Then if worse comes to worst, Arya has got a gun with her. I, that's the plan, Ram, okay. And we're protecting like that. That's intelligence, you know? And that doesn't mean that we're saying, oh no, Ram is better than Arya, no. But based on the circumstance, Arya should be protected, you know? And so the protection and vulnerability, being vulnerable is not a weakness. And we should never look at it like that. Being vulnerable is actually a strength because we can all turn to Krishna and tell Krishna, yo man, what can I do by myself without you? I can do nothing without you. I need you, Krishna. Help me out, dude. <laughs> Blue boy with the flu. <laughs> but if we think, no, I'm macho, I'm a strong guy, then I can figure it out by myself. Then how's Krishna going to help us? But he wants us to be vulnerable. And so going back to my point, based on a particular body or circumstance or situation or personality that you have, some things will be a pro in your side, some things will be a con. We have this within ourselves. For example, some people tell me that I talk too much. <laughs> That's a con. I have what you call verbal diarrhea. If I start, at times you need to tell me to stop. But at times, if I use my verbal diarrhea in speaking about spiritual things, it can actually be helpful, relevant, useful. So I'm not just blabbering about nonsense. So we have, to, we have things that are not probably the best within us. Things are the best. And we work with both of them and see how can I dovetail this towards my spiritual reality. That's what we're being pushed for. That's the power of Krishna consciousness. That's the power of mantra meditation. The more you keep on chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Ram Hare Hare. You actually start to feel that, bro, this body and me are actually two different things. It's amazing. It's powerful. One, when you say it, it's like, okay, calm, you know? Yeah, it's part of the scriptures. Yeah, Prabhupada says it in his books. Yeah, yeah. But if you actually experience this body as separate from yourself, feel yourself as an occupier of this body, it's mad. It's lit. And so if even someone judges you one time and is like, oh, you know, Ian, your face looks like this. It's like, yeah, that's just my face. If you got to see my soul, you'll be dumbfounded. If you got to know who I truly was, you'd be amazed. And you'll notice 
for those who are being bullied, for example, I don't know if anyone here has experienced bullying. Show of hands with the people who have their, who have their cameras on. Some of I experienced bullying. Yeah. Some of us may experience it on a gross way or in a subtle way. From people who've experienced it, we understand that these people who are attacking us based on something that we're not truly, fully are. That's not, okay, wait, let me phrase that nicely. We're being attacked for something that we are not. I'm more than this body. Iron is more than that body. You know, he's a spiritual spark of goodness. You know, that's about to spread loads of light in this world if he does it right. Arya is another one. Vinay is another one. Hitar is another one. And you notice, how many have been a bully? Anyone been a bully? I've been a bully. One way, shape or form. So you'll also notice, my, I was being a bully because I was judging someone based on the body. I was being a bully for judging someone based on something that they're not. And so if we have this understanding, then we also see that this whole gender equality debate that's sprung up in modern day society doesn't apply to people like us who've transcended. It doesn't mean that now you, oh, she's a lady, so I'm gonna treat her different. You treat her with respect. Treat her with kindness, care, and understanding that she's a spiritual soul who also has Krishna within our heart. And then everything's chilling, man. It's like no stress. You know what I mean? That's the power of spiritual. And this is why I like it. Because it literally eradicates any forms of judgment. Eradicates any form of, um, you know, you versus me or this versus that. Someone posted a question. And actually, this one I got sent privately. Let me see if I, if I can get it here. Someone asked me, do you feel that transgender people are at a disadvantage in KC life? Can you be LGBT in KC? And if you can be, then is it more difficult or easier in any way? The same options are there for everyone. The same options are there for everyone. Because as I mentioned, this is just the body. This is just a vessel. But you can utilize this vessel to channel yourself spiritually based on where you're at individually. It's your own journey, your own personal, individual growth journey that you have to kind of ride, ride that wave. And so even if that's how people identify, you will find people like this. You will find people who have a different conditioning. That's not the conventional ABC conditioning that the world explains. But they are a spirit soul. They are trying to connect to Krishna. They're trying to dive deep into their spiritual identity beyond this body. They all have that facility. But just like as I mentioned, the style moves that Katana will make are not the same one that Scorpion will make. So similarly for them, they might have to get guidance on, okay, what will work best for me to dive in spiritually? And the avenues are available. And so that's how you know that Krishna consciousness is the best because there's no judgment. We ain't going to judge you. If we're judging you, then we have to judge ourselves. That's the power. That's the power of what Krishna consciousness is. That's the power of what Prabhupada gave us. That's the power of spiritual life. And so really for us, just to conclude, we're not really fast about this equality thing. But we know that anyone that we come across, be they of a similar body or biological makeup than me, like myself, or if they have a different biological framework, I can treat them and serve them with love, care and devotion and get them closer to Krishna based on my abilities. And if I can't, I put my hands up and I say, peace, G, I did my beat. Krishna will sort you out with the rest. Now I also need to go and focus on my spirituality. But the best way we can be able to understand this is if we connect within ourselves internally, much more powerfully. Reading the Bhagavad Gita, chanting, Connecting and discussing spiritual life from this kind of angles will help us to realize it. Krishna will see, ah, I see you, Shivani. You're doing a good job. You're studying my books. So if someone's stressing you out on the bodily platform, I'll help you transcend it. Yeah? 
Mr. Katri, ah, my guy, people are disturbing you on your end. No worries, because you're chanting Hare Krishna and you're kind of trying to connect spiritually. I'll make you have the strength to deal with it. In the Gita, there's a verse, Tesham Satata Yukta Nam, Bajatam Priti Purvakam, Dadami Buddhi Yogam Fam, Yena Mamu Payantite. Krishna says that if you dive deep, connect to Him with love and devotion, He'll give you the intelligence on how you can come to Him. Within your heart, He starts to guide. And He says, I do this, do that. Okay, this might not be the best thing for you. I know yeah, you want to you wanna go, you wanna go play Fortnite with your mates at like 10 p.m. But actually, it's better for you to just finish that one round and then go to bed early. And you'll start, and even if you start to meditate more on this inner voice, <laughs> I know you've been exposed. <laughs> start to, you know, meditate on this inner voice. Gradually, you'll see how Krishna is guiding you throughout everything in your life. And if you have that, yeah, there we go, I'm not the body. <laughs> and if you have that kind of an understanding, then you can treat people and see people in the same way. So if somebody else from the outside asks you, hey, um, how can we solve gender inequality? Your first answer should be by being Krishna conscious. That should be your first answer. And with that, I'll finish that. And I'll go into the questions. We've got some questions. I hope that was okay. I don't know if anyone, if, if I made any offenses, please forgive me. As I mentioned, I'm a Dumbo, but I try my best and I'm around amazing, intelligent people like yourselves. So I'm going to go through these questions. I just read one. Let me see if there's another one here that was sent. So one question came. Oh, wow. Oh, these are actually next level questions. <laughs> One question came, should women be Diksha Gurus? <laughs> That's quite an interesting question. I don't think I have the capacity to answer that based on myself. There's definitely many much bigger resources. But as I mentioned, based on a particular body, these propensities that work towards your advancement, these propensities that make it much more difficult for you to progress in certain aspects. And so based on what you can handle and what you have the ability to do, with the proper guidance of Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra, you can make proper choices. It is in our scriptures we see that, you know, we have female Diksha Gurus in the past. And we also see Gurus in the sense that they're, they're teaching and giving guidance. Some of your teachers in class are female and they have a proper understanding of what they're teaching in the class. So probably based on like the linear system, some things might be rigid, but it doesn't kill the general um, principle that we can still learn and grow from everyone. So probably from a philosophical angle, it's seen that no, actually, um, it, men have had this and this is the leeway that's been given to mothers. But we understand the general principle anyway. Some of my top mentors are ladies, they're mothers, seniors in the mission. And they give me good advice on how to trudge on. And I respect them just like I respect any of the male counterparts. I pay my obeisances to both. I hope that answers that question. Another questions come. Can karma be related to what gender you're born into? Of course. I got my astrology read and someone said you were attached to your mother in, uh, uh, no, your mother in your past life was your dad and you were his daughter. And so you were attached so much that in this life you came in as the son because <laughs> you were thinking about your dad and then you came in a male body and she was thinking about you and, uh, I, and she was, you know, obviously in a male body and got into a female body because my mom and I, we have this very, very toxic attachment. We fight like siblings. And so when our astrology was done, they said, actually, there could be a link like that. So to some extent, yes, based on karma and what you meditate upon as you live one body, you assume a form that's suitable for that in your other body body like this Ari, is this a question that you're asking um yeah only if it's okay i just go ahead you know, i love it i just wanted to unmute because i didn't think i'd be able to type it out properly that's um, right so like i think this is based on something that you said a little bit earlier about like men and women having different psychology and them having different ages i actually wrote it down so let me pull it up um 
And oh, so when we hear about men and women playing different roles according to their strengths and um, their natures being aligned to that, then like, does it really matter if we adhere to them or not because we're ultimately spirit soul? Good question, good question. Does it matter if we're here, if we are spirit soul, then we probably don't need to focus too much on that. But this is the thing, you're in a vessel, your vessel has to function. So based on how it has to function, there's certain specs that will work on this. It's like you have an unleaded car. I don't know if you guys understand vehicles. I, I don't really know them too well, but some cars are unleaded, or I think that's unleaded. I'm not too sure if that's the right pronunciation. English came on a boat for me. And then some of them is premium. So if I go to put premium fuel on an unleaded car, because they're both cars anyway, and it doesn't matter, they're both vehicles, my car won't function properly. So even though we're all spirit souls, based on the body we're in, there's different things we can channel to spark up this spirituality, right? So for example, you know, let's say, I don't know, Arya, what's, what, what's your fun, in Krishna consciousness, what do you find your most fun activity is? Gosh, um, reading. Like so read. you love to read, right? You enjoy reading. But if I came and I told you, Arya, for the need, I want you to help build the tents for Janmashtami. I don't want you to read. Because that's not in your nature and not in your propensity, you will still do it because you know it's service. Or probably you might skip a few days. <laughs> but you would rather enjoy something that's much more tuned to your propensity as Arya, right? So if Arya would probably prefer to be in the Janmashtami team, that's great getting interesting quotes from the Bhagavad Gita and creating nice slideshows templates based on that, you'd find that more interesting, isn't it? Than having to go and build up the tents. But it's all service anyway, Arya. Why are you finding one interesting than the other? Because that's more suited to your personality. And so this is where spirituality becomes, although we have the general principle, it becomes more personal. That, okay, the general principle says this, but what's more personal to me and my relationship with Krishna? What gives me that bar of, mm, Krishna, I want to think about you. For you, it's when you read. For some people, it's when they do kirtan. For some people, it's when they do pujari service. Like I like to do pujari service. I like to wash Krishna's plates because I'm not really a thinker. So I just wash his plates and I hope for some mercy. <laughs> There's different things based on where we're at. For some people, you know, they'll, they'll engage in a sport. And when they're asked, how, how did you manage to do this? They'll be like, first of all, I want to thank Krishna Swayam Bhagavan, Supreme Personality of Godhead. That's how they'll channel it. So it's very, very individual and very, very unique. And so that's, that's the reason. But on an ultimate basis, once we deepen our practice, we reach a stage where we act, it doesn't matter. You'll do anything because your soul just wants to serve Krishna. But because we're in a particular body and encaged based on our natures and attributes, we'll work with them and see what suits us. And from there, you this is actually a trick and I'll give you a secret. If you want to go deep in your spiritual life, we have our basic, which is chanting and reading Prabhupada's books. Try to do these activities in a way that works for you. For example, some people can manage to read. I struggle reading. So you know what I do? I listen to a lecture from someone I like to hear. <laughs> And then I listen to what they explain about this one verse and purport. And then I go through it so that I'm getting to read something and I'm getting to churn it the way I'd understand it. Some people prefer audiobooks. Some people prefer a chat. So find what works for you. And you'll notice what works for you might be different from your friend. But if it makes you want to chant Hare Krishna, makes you want to go deep, makes you want to share this with others, then do it. You got to do it. All right. I hope that helps. Hare Krishna. I think there's some more questions. Aha, okay. There's this one. I was waiting for this question. I knew it was going to come. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna described women as being of lower birth and less intelligent. Was he referring to how they are viewed by society or are females born with qualities less favorable in comparison to men? How should we interpret these verses? Oh, wait, can I shout you out? If, I, I hope you don't mind me shouting yeah, you out. That was a good, that's an intelligent question. Hands down, hands down. Intelligent question. Now, you know what I'm going to do is, 
Okay, let me first explain it to you guys in this way. When we look at the Gita, we're trying to, we're understanding the Gita from the context of the conversation that Krishna was having with Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, right? The context is, it's a battle. Things are about, I'm going to get crunk in a minute, right? So Arjuna becomes bewildered emotionally. And he says, yo, these are, my, these are my family. These are people that I know, people that I have an affiliation with. How am I supposed to kill them? When we were looking at masculinity versus femininity, we said that what? The, the um, masculinity is, the masculine energy is more stoic, right? But here we see Arjuna acting with more emotion in a stern decision that he has to make. And so when Prabhupada dives deep into explaining one, some of the aspects based on this discussion, he mentions that women are less intelligent, but we understand intelligence from different angles. The intelligence being applied in the Bhagavad Gita is not one of emotional intelligence, it's one of transaction. Arjuna's situation is, I have to kill these people even though I don't want to for the pleasure of Krishna that becomes much more intellectual intelligence, which for a lady or for one in, with much more feminine energy might be more difficult to have. If I was to tell you, Bhavini, tomorrow you have to kill your parents, it would be very difficult for you to say, okay, fine, cool, I'm gonna do it in one shot, you know? Oh, my airport just blew out, sorry. It'd be very difficult to just like do it like that, you know? It's gonna be super tough because the emotional propensity from feminine energy is quite stronger. But the context here is that Arjuna is having to make that kind of a choice and he actually ends up having to kill all these people. So when we understand intelligence there, intelligence is being looked at emotional because you have, so you have two types of intelligence, right? You've got intellectual IQ, intellectual intelligence, intellectual quotient, which is what Arjuna is having to express in this fight. Then you have emotional caution, which is more of an emotional basis. So Arjuna is an example of a person who makes a decision based on IQ, where there it seems that, okay, the ladies is much more less. When you jump to EQ, a personality, um, you could say like uh, Queen Kunti, makes an emotionally elevated decision, which is highly transcendental and is seen as actually that's the perfection of spiritual life. She says, give me suffering, Krishna. Break my heart so I can think about you more. You know, that's deep. You know, and so there, the male masculine energy is actually less intelligent because they can't perceive that level of submission. But Queen Kunti could. So we can see it in that context. That's just how it also looks. The other verse talks about lower birth, women, sudras, vaishas. Again, it comes based on this context. In the Vedic times and Vedic um, civilization, actually, first of all, wait, let me see if I can pull up this verse for you guys also to kind of look at it as well. I think it is chapter nine. If you have your Bhagavad Gita with you as well, you can probably have a look at it and kind of um, churn it. So I think it's 930 something. Yeah. 9.32. So if you have your Bhagavad Gita, but I'll also share my screen. And hopefully you guys will be able to see it. Can you guys see that? It's clear. The Sanskrit, everything is, is there. Perfect. So here it says, O son of Pritha, those who take shelter of me, though they be of lower birth, women, Vaishyas, merchants, and Sudras, can attain the supreme destination. Now, if we come up here and look at the Sanskrit, this is a little bit slightly more technical. Papa, Yon, Papa Yonaya is this, is born of a lower family. Striya is women. Vaisha is mercantile people. And Sudra is lower class men. So can you see, you've got men who are lower class here, right? Papa Yona, Yonaya is actually people born out of the Varnashram system. 
So the Vanashram system has your Kshatriyas, your Vaishyas, your Brahmans, and your Shudras. But you also have your Mlechas, your Yavanas, you know, the meat eaters, right? So these classify as the lower birth. So you have lower birth, women, Vaishyas, and Shudras. That's actually how it's described. And if you look at the purport, Prabhupada explains it in this way. Let me see if I can find it. You see, so when he's talking about Chandalas, dog eaters. These are the lower birth. That's lower birth definition. Women, same category in the sense that the women were not really performing Brahminical Vedic activities as it's been allowed right now by Srila Prabhupada. So Prabhupada came and broke it and was like, all right, the, the, those in a female body can do it. In Vedic times, that wasn't really being permissible, wasn't permissible. And so I think Prabhupada, there's a place where Prabhupada explains this. I think I was reading it at some point. So yeah, even the lowest were the Chandalas. So the lowest actually of mankind are Chandalas. They can be purified by association with a pure devotee. Therefore, devotional service and the guidance of a pure devotee are so strong that there's no discrimination between the lower and higher classes of men. Anyone can take to it. The word men here is not just used as man or woman. Men also includes both men and women and children. Anyone born, you know, that's the English uh, literary. The most simple man can take shelter of the pure devotee. Um, the most simple man taking shelter of the pure devotee can be purified by proper guidance. According to the different modes of material nature, men are classified in the mode of goodness, passion. Um, no, yeah, mode of goodness, mode of passion and in the mixed modes of passion and ignorance, and in the modes of ignorance. Can you see? Brahmans, Kshatriyas or administrators, Vaishyas or merchants, Sudras or workers. In each of these categories, you can find both male and females. Men and women born in Brahman families, men and women born in Kshatriya families, men and women born in Sudra families, like this. So we can understand actually, it's not making a distinction on the level at which it might be looked at that, oh, you know, women are actually of lower birth. No, that's just how it's being categorized contextually to make us understand that everyone besides the Brahmins themselves can actually attain perfection and reach the spiritual kingdom. You know, we have Yamuna Devi, who's a perfect example in our Krishna consciousness movement. Prabhupada mentioned Yamuna Devi is in the platform of Bhav. She was actually much more advanced than her husband. What are you going to say about that, though? <laughs> what are you going to say? Because it's not on the bodily platform. You can transcend it. And that's the power. And that's the magic of Krishna consciousness. I hope that makes it clear as well or makes it um, easy to understand. At times, it's, the juxtaposition can seem a little bit interesting. But we, when we dive a little bit deeper, look at the Sanskrit, look at the context, then we can see it much more clearly like that. I hope that helps answer your question, Bhavani. Yeah, let's see. There's actually quite a few questions. Richa asks, does that mean we can use spiritual knowledge as an excuse to judge others or use the material knowledge to judge the spiritual souls? Of course not. No, because if you're spiritual, you're starting on the platform of non-judgment because you're looking at everyone based on the spirit soul. So you're not going to judge anyone based on that. Your judgment would probably be that, oh, these guys identify more with the body. They judge people based on how they look. You know, you're, are you going to join that crew that just talks bad about people in school? Is that the crew you want to join though? At times it might seem like it's a cool score that backbites, but is that really it? No, it's not. So when you have spiritual knowledge, the judgment, the disparity, the comparisons, they naturally disintegrate out of your consciousness. You don't really have them as a priority. Let's see. Um, okay, I don't know if this came, if male and female energy complement each other and balance each other out, how would this work in a homosexual man? Hey, hey, guys. <laughs> Same way, based on an individual's intensity that suits their personality, if it works for them, then they can curtail a circumstance. However, we know that um, the conventional way of practice is fixed, right? It's quite fixed that, you know, 
the, in, 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 in Christianity they used to say, Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. <laughs> because that's what, that's what the scriptures stipulate. That's the direction that's been there. But as we understand, besides these four classes, these personalities exist. Even in the Vedic scriptures, these personalities were there. And the same thing, based on an intensity that suited their personality, they worked themselves to be able to dive spiritually. You know? So if two personalities feel like that's what works for them, and they're honestly trying to advance to Krishna, then based on the proper guidance from the society and the community, they make an arrangement. Other than that, then they judge themselves. Then it's like, oh, then I'm not human. And then what happens? Cases of suicide of, oh, I wish I was born in a different body or this or that. And it becomes depressive. I know people who've gone through serious depression because of this. Coming from an African background, if you were to be known to have such a conditioning, they would burn you on the street. They take a tire and they oil you up and boom, set you ablaze. And I've seen it happen to people. It's actually quite traumatic. But because we have a, a spiritual understanding, then based on a particular individual's propensity and ability, you work with what they've got to advance spiritual, spiritually. Someone asked, what did Prabhupada say about homosexuality? Prabhupada didn't comment because he was actually beyond these things. He only spoke about getting beyond the concept of I am this body. It doesn't matter if you're black, white, yellow, green, red, purple, maroon. You're a spirit soul. That's where it starts. That's where the platform of being human starts. That's what we need to inculcate. You meet people of such different kinds. You meet, you'll know that there's a kitchery out there in this world. The kitchen is not just in the house. You'll find the kitchen in so many different mindsets and people that you meet as you mature in your life. But you'll be able to see them through the right lens, which is spirituality. That this is a spiritual soul in a body that probably has X, Y, and Z, but is a spiritual soul. Some people probably, that's not the association they want to have. So they respect from a distance and they work with the association that they want to have. Some people probably are comfortable. So they, you know, they relate and associate in the proper way, but keeping to their principles and to what they believe is a proper mature way to function. So you'll notice that spirituality puts us in a much more mature way of thinking. I hope that helps. Um, okay, some questions actually are not even to do with gender equality. So it looks like um, there's a lot. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, Bhavani quoted this. So I'm just, I'm just looking through the chat. There's so many things that I've gotten. So it's like. So Niam asks, you said you need the male and female energy to maintain a proper balance. So how does this work for brahmacharis? Similarly, just as I explained, within us, in our body, you do have aspects and attributes that could be particularly more on the masculine side of things and more on the feminine side of things. So in your own progress individually, you'll see what can I curtail for my own balance? You know, and if you can't do it, then that's why they decide, okay, I'll get a wife <laughs> so that she can give me that female energy that I need. You know, so that's the way people look at it. But otherwise, um, you, it, it, it's an individual thing. You know your own propensities, what works for you. And if you don't, you take to the practice to be able to understand this more clearly. Then you can see, okay, what can I do in my life like this? Jamika asks, in your opinion, Imprabhu, do you ever think that genders will be seen as equal? I personally don't think it even needs to be a discussion because we're all spirit souls. I actually believe in this. We're not this body. When I used to experience racism because I'm in a, you know, I'm in a black man's body, I used to think, whoa, will there be a day where people will actually look at me and not judge my body? Up until I found Krishna consciousness and understood actually I'm not this body. So if someone's judging me based on the body, they just are wearing the wrong glasses and I should probably buy them a new pair. <laughs> These kind of designations and comparisons naturally transcend for a sadhu, for a person driving in Krishna consciousness, for a person in spirituality. And it's a nice vision. Krishna says in the Gita, they look at an elephant, a dog, a, a gentle brahmana, an elephant, a dog, and a dog eater with the same vision. It's actually a good vision to have. 
but we have to cultivate it, chant, connect to the scriptures. And that's it. That's how we'll achieve it. Um, are there categories in souls? For example, through the way they, they were liberated. No, there's no categories of the souls. The liberation will only happen based on what that body has to experience. The karma, you remember we said guna, karma, vibhagasha. Based on guna and karma, you get a particular kind of body. So you'll have to go through a particular kind of purification so that you can actually transcend. So it's not like oh, you go back to the spiritual world and be like, oh, Ram, it took you an extra lifetime, bro. You must have been a criminal. Nah, he probably has his own journey that he needed to learn a particular thing and you have your own. So you won't be like, hey, Ram, man, you're pretty slow, my G. No, you can't compare it like that. It's very, very individual. Shamsunda asks, do genders have an effect on the ashrams we're in? In today's world, it's harder to practice for an ashram. Does the conditioning of gender affect our respective ashram and the importance of an ashram? Actually, it doesn't. So you, an ashram, actually, if we look at it from the, you know, Brahmachari, Grihastha, Vanaprastha, Sanyas, that only really happened to the male, to the men. The men were the ones who were put in austere circumstances as brahmacharis. They would only eat when the guru tells them to eat. If guru forgot to tell them to eat, they would fast, you know? And it's like, okay, we ain't having no meal tonight because guru didn't say anything. They would go through tapasya, austerity, you know? And then they would be able to go through the ashrams like this. Something like, for example, I'm trying to go through, although it's quite chilled out here, you know. If I'm hungry, I just go downstairs. It's Mahaprasad. I don't need to wait for someone to tell me. I'll just shove it all in. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, for the men, that's what, that was a structure, that they went through Varnashram in this way, that they first started as Brahmachari, Kriyasta, Vanaprasta, then Sanyas. The ladies, when they, when, uh, as they were growing, they understood scriptures, understood philosophy, understood how to maintain a home. And then when Krishna would arrange for them to jump into the Grihastha Ashram, they would jump into the Grihastha Ashram and then progress in the same way. They didn't have to go through the same austerities that the men have to go through, which they're actually very lucky <laughs> that they don't have to deal with that because it's not easy to some extent. So yeah, based on that journey, yes, Varnashram is, is difficult to practice in this age, but we can pick things that work for us. You will see that for everyone, you need to add some austerity. For both the girls and the guys, you wake up in the morning and it's like, oh, I have to chant my rounds. Oh, I don't want to do it today. That's an austerity you both will have to apply. And this is why Prabhupada is merciful. He's kind of put us all on an equal playing field, but still working with your own individual personality. What works for me? Might be different from what works for you and so we're going to make it work in that way well there's loads of questions wow <laughs> um krishna always says we must perform our duties and devotees are very kind and caring people which in the end is like being attached but also not being attached at the same time we are very attached as we know krishna is in everyone and so we perform our duty with attachment towards others by using the knowledge of Krishna in every... Oh, wow. Mr. Man's giving me philosophy out here. Definitely, we will work with detachment because we start to see from the eyes of the scriptures. The difference between us and someone who's not practicing spirituality is because these are my glasses. And I kind of see through this. So I have my own perception or vision of the world. I look through this and then I project, I make decisions. So when we make decisions based on the vision of scripture, then we advance, we grow, we connect like that. Ah, oh. wow, there's actually quite a, okay, wait, is there any more questions here? Probably gone through many of them. Okay, so these ones are finished, I think. Unless if someone also feels like they want to like undo themselves from the chat. I mean, unmute their mic and ask a question, please go ahead. I'm more than happy. But let's see, there must be another question here that came. That was outside of the topic, but I said I'd still answer it. If that's okay. So someone asks, 
Okay, this isn't really to do with the gender equality, sorry, regarding karma and reincarnation. Is it based on our actions or our intention and the amount of knowledge we had at the time of that action? Karma and reincarnation. So basically, based on your past activities, you have this particular body to be able to um, perform those activities. Based on your past desires, you cooked this particular body so you can be able to fulfill those desires. So when you reincarnate into another form, that karma comes into play. And also what you think at the time of death comes into play also. So Krishna says that if you think about me as you live in your body, then you come to me. And that's why when a person is about to leave their body in Krishna consciousness or who knows about devotees, what do people do? They go to the house and they do rocking kirtan until the person leaves. So that that person's chanting Krishna's name or at least hearing the names of Krishna so they can get a boost and see Krishna and then go back to Krishna like that. So it's a combination. Your actions, your karma. Karma is action in one sense, but let's say your bank balance karma and also what you meditate upon at the time of you leaving your body, that also determines where you go. So some people are like, okay, I, you know what? I want to be rich in my next life. So let me just meditate on wealth. But then <laughs> if your consciousness is in the wrong place, then you'll be born, let's say in like a beehive as like the queen bee with many bees, but you're still a bee. <laughs> so you get like that kind of wealth and dominance. You have your own beehive, but still you're not getting it the way you'd want to enjoy it. So that's why Krishna says the safest way is just think about me. Because at least if you think about me and you still have a material desire to be rich, you'll be rich in your next life. But we don't want to do that. We want to go back to the spiritual world where we can have a good time because that's guaranteed to be flawless. It's guaranteed to be a lit party in the spiritual world like that. Another question came in. I don't know how we're doing for time. It's 10 to 9. And I still see this 56 people. That's a lot. So I'll probably carry on on like one or two more questions and then call it after. Um, another question came. What can you do if you want to follow a career, but feel like you will lose interest in Krishna consciousness or will be surrounded by people who don't care about it? That was the thing for me, actually. the Because you talk about acting and that was my situation. I was in the, in the acting industry and I was doing a lot of like modeling, photography and stuff like that. But the unfortunate circumstance is the people that are doing my photo shoots, the people that are doing the makeup, the costumes and everything are not devotees. And so one time I enter a building and the person doing my makeup is holding a cigarette in their mouth. <laughs> and so it can be challenging. <laughs> you know, if you have a passion for something and you feel that you want to utilize it in one way or another to serve Krishna, then include Krishna in your plan. You know, you gave the example of acting here in this question, but it could be anything. Some people want to be producers, DJs, rappers, everything. But if you're trying to be a rapper in this industry and then you start finding yourself in the same room as someone like Skepta or Stormzy, you probably find yourself taking sh two shots of alcohol, which is not what you want. So we go to Krishna and we ask Krishna, okay, Krishna, I want to pursue this, but I want to do it in a safe way for my spiritual life. Guide me on how to do it. And now, for example, I get to incorporate my acting skills in a Krishna conscious way, I do dramas and plays, you know, to be able to exercise my skill, if it's a skill, and utilize it to serve others in this way. And then even if you make it big, look at Jay Shetty. He's made it big in an industry that you'll not probably find people of his caricature, but he's made it. And he's still following principles, still chanting his 16 rounds, still following regulated principles and being guided by a spiritual master. So it's actually possible. If you get the proper guidance, you can do anything. But the thing is, you have to get guidance. You can't just do it by yourself. You know, you need someone to help you out, to kind of help you see, a senior, someone you can trust. Like for me, if I want anything to do with you guys, I go to Niam. He's my senior. He tells me, okay, probably this topic would be good. Okay, I think you should talk about this. I leave it up to you, but I think this would be a nice topic. And so, you know, you need people to give you guidance like that. Alrighty, I think that was it. Let's see. Um, is there another question? So I'll probably, yeah, I, can, I guess I'll finish off there. I really hope that I've been able to answer your questions. I hope that this was not a boring situation for you. And even if it was, I probably got one or two things that's kind of helpful. 
This is a little bit also slightly more technical because we need to understand things philosophically. So there's not much banter that can be coming out of my mouth when I'm trying to be philosophically correct. <laughs> but I still try my best to be as relatable as possible. I hope that helps. If anyone has any other questions, comments, please do wait for new messages. Wagwan. Okay. Whoa. Why is liberation? Okay, this is a good one. Why is liberation seen as an end goal? Is in the journey towards God and the enhancement of our soul a constant journey that we have to maintain? Also, why isn't life on earth considered as heaven or a place of eternal happiness itself? Good questions. Probably, okay, I'll conclude with this one. So actually for the Bhakti Yogi, liberation is not a goal. It is said if you're practicing Krishna consciousness, you're al already liberated. Eh? already liberated sorry eh. <laughs> english came on a boat for me remember you're already liberated if you're um practicing krishna consciousness what does liberation mean you're stopping your entanglement with the modes of material nature the modes of material nature are affecting us day in day out but if you dive deep into krishna consciousness then the modes of material nature stop influencing you for example the modes of material nature stipulate that from 6 p.m. all the way up to 2 a.m. is mode of ignorance time. That's when people sleep, relax, watch Netflix, mind their own business, don't do their homework, and just become lazy. <laughs> but then look at you guys. What time is it? It's 8.55 and you're here on a call talking about spirituality. So there you've technically defied the laws of material nature. Some people after a talk like this would pick their bead bag and chant Hare Krishna. A mode of goodness activity in a time where it can be mode of ignorance. So you've broken that bond. So for the devotee, liberation is not really a thing. The devotee wants to transcend this liberation and actually have this personal interaction with Krishna, where Krishna gets to interact with me as a person. And he gets to see these are my ideals, my likes. I as Mr. Shub, I like this. And Krishna sees that I like it and he, I try to serve Krishna in this way and then Krishna serves me in this way and we have this interesting exchange. So for the devotee, they want to go beyond liberation. Liberation is basic. Lib okay, we can say liberation is like GCSEs and then, um, you know, identifying a much deeper relationship with Krishna is like your A-levels and then Actually getting to see Krishna face to face and diving deep into that um, connection is like your degree. And then your master's PhD is actually being with Krishna. Personally, seeing Krishna the same way I'm looking at you and seeing you, Mr. Niam, on the screen. That's the perfection. That's what we strive for. Because, bro, like you can tell me, oh, Krishna is the supreme personality of God. I want to see him for myself, dude. I don't just want to read it from a book. I want to experience it. And so we have to experience it. We have to work so we can actually see Krishna face to face. Not just as the Murti. Okay, fine. If I want to see Krishna, I go to the back to Dante Mana. Or I Google, oh, Krishna holding a flute, three bent fold. Or I go to Mana Media. Nah. I want to chant Hare Krishna, read the scriptures, and then see Krishna in front of me. Having an exchange with me. Laughing at my jokes, even though they're not funny. <laughs> And giving me some reciprocation that makes me affirm that he actually exists. So even if someone comes and tries to challenge me atheistically, like, oh, he doesn't exist. I know he exists because I've seen him. I've experienced him. He's right here with me like that. That's what we want, you know? And why isn't life on earth considered to be heaven? Because in this place, my G, you can't fully enjoy. I gave this example when I was a kid. I went to my mom to the store, um, to one of the malls in Kenya. And then I saw cotton candy. And I was like, mommy, mommy, I want this cotton candy. And then she was like, okay, fine. If you get this, will you shut up? Okay, fine. And then I got it. Then we walked down and then I see ice lollies, ice cream truck. Mommy, mommy, I want this ice lolly. Ian, but you just, I just gave you, um, I gave you cotton candy. Now you want an ice lolly? Yeah, mom, if I get the ice lolly, I won't want anything else. Okay, fine. Gets me the ice lolly. I eat the ice lolly, I finish it. I used to like this one 
It was called Red Devil because it used to make my tongue red. I used to love it so much. It tastes so good. I don't know if they have it in the UK, but if you find any Red Devils and you feel like you can send me a Red Devil, I'd be very happy. <laughs> then I was walking down and then I see another candy stand that had jawbreakers. And I was like, mommy, mommy, I want a jawbreaker. And my mom was like, surely, Ian, you wanted an, uh, an ice lolly, I gave you. You wanted um, a cotton candy, I gave you. Now you want this and you're still asking for it. Okay, fine. If I give you this, will you be done? Chilling. Okay, fine. I do it. Then as we're about to go into the car, on the side of the road, there's like this guy who's like roasting maize with like the lemon and everything. I think at times, I don't know if you guys like get to see that in India. I don't know if it's there in Wembley, but if it is, I'd want you, you guys also need to show me so I can go. And he's like roasting maize and he's putting all the lemon and chili and everything. And so I'm like, whoa, that looks so good. Mommy, mommy. I want, my mom was just like, shut up and slap me in till we get into the car. I'm giving you everything else. I'm not getting it for you. If you want it, you can meditate on it in your dreams. Nonsense. So what can we understand from this? Is that in this mature world or where we live in right now, our desires can never be fully satisfied. It's very, very difficult. You get a desire and then you think you're about to satisfy this desire. Then once you think, yeah, I've reached, another better desire comes. Then once you think, okay, we've reached there, another one comes. And constantly desires are like piling and piling and piling up that you can never satisfy. A heavenly place is a place where you can actually satisfy these desires with ease. Heavenly planets, that can be done, but still it's limited. And so we don't aspire for the heavenly regions. We aspire for the spiritual world where everything we do gives us gas. You know, we're like feeling good constantly. You're experiencing eating a ladu and you're eternally feeling the goodness of this ladu. <laughs> you're going to sleep and you're feeling the effects of your sleep eternally and there's no reactions no one's gonna come and wake you up and pour water on your face if you want to sleep for five days you can do it that's where we want to go where there's actual enjoyment here in this world uh it's a no for me <laughs> it's the material disturbances for me it's the oh i think i'm satisfied but then something else comes up for me it's the oh i got an iphone 10 but then iphone uh, xl comes out for me it's the, oh, I think I'll have a fun going for my party for, uh, for this party with my friends, but then another bigger party comes up for me. We're never going to be satisfied. There'll always be something bigger and better. You know, you'll always find that there's someone smarter than you. You'll always find that there's someone who's much more pretty looking than you. You can never be the most pretty looking. <laughs> How unfair is that? <laughs> That's the material world. You can never find full happiness here unless you connect it with Krishna. And on that note, I'll finish there. Let's connect with Krishna. Let's get out of this madness. And as we're doing this, let's have a good time with the people we're around, you know? I see such cool people, such cool faces, you know? Swaggy, swaggy people. I'm just, I'm, I'm digging Aryan with his gold chain, you know? I, I feel like he's about to spit some bars if I'm not careful, you know? Uh, I'll probably after this, after you guys finish the session, he's going to spit some bars. I don't know if you guys have something planned to say, you know, and you're all amazing people, wonderful souls. Dia, you're a wonderful person. Never forget that. Jai Kishan, today I don't see your face, but you're a wonderful person. All of you guys are wonderful because you're connecting with Krishna. And that's actually the biggest boon. And so summing that up also to our point, when you're connecting with Krishna, you see everyone regardless of who they are, how they are, whether they do stuff that you don't like, whether they do stuff that pisses you off, you actually become undisturbed by them. And that is the magic of Krishna consciousness. Hare Krishna. I'm going to finish there. Thank you guys so much for tolerating me. 48 people have managed to stay till the end. 48 people got the main secret. <laughs> Thank you guys so, so much. It's an austerity listening to me because I can't even listen to myself. So I imagine how it must be tough for you guys, but you're still listening. So that's a plus. Thank you guys so, so much. I'll hand it over to our boy, Mr. Niam. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Ian, for giving that amazing, amazing class. 
as like it's definitely not austerity. I'm like chilling here, listening to you. I'm like, what? This some like sick information you're giving me. I'm like, it's pretty nice, yeah, it's pretty nice. But within this talk, you've literally like eliminated this idea of gender equality, and you've shown all of us our like our business what we need to do. And let's connect with Krishna. I love that. That's like, such a nice way to end it off. So I like to thank you so much for sharing sharing all this nectar with all of us and always deliver. Thanks so much. SNL Project X, we love you. We love you so much. Drop, drop yeah, everyone drop, drop the appreciation on the chat. Hare Krishna. No, thank you guys for having me. It's nice. You know, I, I get to sleep knowing that I had a chat with some cool peeps today. You know, so thank you guys so much. Wow, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hare Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> really appreciate it. Thank you so, so much. And anywhere I can serve you guys, anywhere I can improve, let me know. Probably I don't explain things properly. Let me know. I'm more than happy. Um, so I can know how to serve you guys properly next time. They say um, criticism and feedback is the breakfast for a champion. So I want to be a champion one day. So I need your feedback. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much for joining. And thank you everyone else that has joined this board at Sanam Project X lot. Thank you so much for coming. It's so good to have everyone's association today. And just always nice to gather, gather with all of you and meet up every now and then. But it's so it's so good, and thanks so much for coming. And SNL and Project X will release the information for our upcoming events soon. So always check your WhatsApp. <laughs>